Hi, this is Joe Paprocki. I'm the National Consultant for Faith Formation at Loyola Press, a Jesuit ministry operating out of Chicago. And it is my privilege to be here with you today as the host for this webinar, Accompanying People in Pain. And we have uh, four very uh, wonderful and talented and very caring um, panelists who are with us today who specialize in walking with people in pain, accompanying people in pain, and offering us help in that area. And so we can't wait to get to them in a couple of minutes. Let me just take a, a, a moment for some uh, housekeeping. Uh, first of all, to, to let you know that the, we're in webinar mode, which means that you will only see and hear the panelists. You will not be able to turn on a camera or a microphone. Uh, please do use the chat to introduce yourself. Take a look there and see uh, your brothers and sisters from all over the world who are gathering in this community for today to talk about uh, accompanying people in pain. Also, please use the Q&A feature for uh, asking questions of our panelists because we will, in the last quarter of our hour together, spend some time with some Q&A with our panelists. Um, and uh, a recording of this webinar will be available to you. So after the webinar, you'll receive an email uh, with a link to that recording. And we invite you to watch it again, share the link with others, tell others, hey, there's some great advice here for how to accompany people in, in pain. And so jumping in, just to start uh, with that first word, accompany. You know, accompaniment has, uh, is kind of a buzzword, uh, especially in Catholic circles. Pope Francis has used this word a lot. And so we chose that word for, for this um, webinar uh, very intentionally, because we believe that this is uh, part of what we're called to do, is to accompany people, and uh, we're going to unpack what that means and to focus in on the whole idea of uh, accompanying people who are experiencing pain. Um, and so without further ado, let me introduce our panelists here. All right, we're about ready to jump right in, and I, what I'm going to do is just very briefly mention the person's name and say hi, and then invite them to tell us a little bit uh, about themselves. And so, uh, Maureen, I'm going to start with you, Maureen Lyons-Andrews. Uh, she is the uh, author of a handbook for those who grieve. Hi, Maureen, how are you? I'm fine, Joe. Thank you very much for having us today. Great, thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Maureen, especially perhaps how you got into the ministry of uh, accompanying those who grieve. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm from the south side of Chicago. Um, I was kind of uh, raised over in Mount Greenwood area, St. Christina's Parish. And when you're from Chicago, everybody knows you're from a parish, you know. So everyone knows where St. Christina's is. And then I went to school at uh, in Orland Park, St. Michael's. And then uh, we raised our family at the parish of St. Christopher's in Midlothian. So I am a volunteer. I um, took a lead from the parish priest. We were having the um, program, um, Christ Renews His Parish. Yes. And everybody was asked, what can you give? Um, can, is there anything that you give to someone else? Uh, and so everyone went for uh, a weekend of discernment. And I was drawn to the uh, bereavement group. It just sounded like everyone was afraid and no one knew what to say. And I said, mm. oh my gosh, I want to be part of that. I want to learn more how I can help others. And then once you find out uh, your little forte, th that's all that it took. It's just that one invite from the parish. And I said, I, I, yeah, I raised my hand. Let me help, you know. Wonderful. And you found your calling. Uh, and, and that is the, how it happens. And so thank you for sharing that. And we're going to get back to you in just a minute, Jean, because I mean, Maureen, we're going to be starting with you. Uh, but as you can tell, I'm jumping ahead to Jean. And so <laughs> I want to introduce uh, Jean Heaton. And Jean is the, the author of um, uh, families Helping Families Recover from Addiction. And we did a, a webinar with uh, Jean uh, several months back. And so welcome back, Jean. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. So tell us uh, a little thumbnail uh, as well about how uh, you came to feel that uh, you could share with other people about walking with people uh, in addiction. 
Um, well, I had a, an adult child that had a, that suffered from an addiction and, um, or suffers from an addiction because it doesn't ever go away. But, um, in, in my, um, research to not do any harm, um, I kind of stumbled upon Ignatian spirituality and its parallels with the 12 steps and was so impressed by the tools that are available to us that I knew nothing about, um, that I just kept studying, kept deep diving until I decided I wanted to share it with other people. So. That's wonderful, Jean, and uh, we thank you for that. And we also thank you for your your uh, honest sharing because uh, this, of all categories, uh, requires a, a great deal of uh, of honesty. And you've put yourself out there, and we really appreciate that uh, to share your story, your firsthand experience with us. And we look forward to getting back to you in uh, just a few moments to talk about how to accompany folks who are struggling with the pain of addiction. Let's turn now to uh, Barbara Lee, who is the author of a number of books, uh, but the one we're going to focus on today is Praying Through Pain. Hi, Barbara. Good to see you again. Hi, Joe, and hello from New York. Uh, I'm a spiritual director, and I came very late to this ministry. I had a career as a lawyer and a judge. And in retirement, I joined the Ignatian Volunteer Corps, which is an organization of retired people and empty nesters who do volunteer work among the poor in the context of Ignatian spirituality. And we meet regularly to pray and study together. And as I was delving deeper into Ignatian spirituality, I was attracted to spiritual direction. So I spent three summers at Creighton University learning how to walk with people on the spiritual journey. And in the course of that training, I came to realize that this late calling was no accident because I was and am called to minister to older people, primarily, not exclusively. Uh, praying through pain is directed to a general audience because pain can strike anyone at any time. But uh, in my talk today, I'm going to focus on the pain of older adults. Okay. Well, thank you, Barbara. And we look forward to uh, returning to you in just a few moments to talk about uh, your insights about accompanying people with uh, who are suffering through the pains that come with aging. Uh, on to our final panelist, well, Ann Kurtz-Kearney. And uh, good to have Ann back again. How are you, Ann? Great, Joe. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Ann is the, the author of uh, Spiritual Practices for the Brain. And uh, while it's not particularly a, a book uh, about pain per se, it certainly uh, deals with uh, lots of practices and strategies that are helpful for people experiencing pain. And we asked Ann to talk uh, about um, the, uh, the, the experience of the pain of stress and anxiety. So, Ann, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how um, that focus is, is going to be your forte today. Thanks, Joe. Um, so my background is in science, positive psychology, and theology. And what I love is the intersection of those three disciplines and how there are practices that each one recommends to keep our broad bodies and brains healthy. And when we think about stress and anxiety and difficulties, painful difficulties, these all three of these areas have some wonderful practices and advice to help us, and also just some reframing of how we think about things. So um, I'm very much drawn to this intersection of these disciplines. And so that's what I write about in my book. And I love sharing this information with people because it's been so helpful to me. And I know it has helped others with whom I've shared it. So I'm happy to be here this afternoon. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to all of our panelists, uh, not only for joining us, but for writing your these wonderful books. And we'll have information at the end, uh, once again, of uh, how you can purchase these books, which are a way of helping other people, helping yourself and helping other people. And that's what we're about at uh, Loyola Press. And so we're very proud to be associated with people who write books like these. Um, 
a couple of thoughts before we jump into uh, talking with uh, uh, Maureen first about accompanying those in the pain of grieving. Um, Barbara says in, in her book, Praying Through Pain, and this is Barbara is the master of stating the obvious, and I, it, which needs to be stated <laughs> quite often. There are as many kinds of pain as there are people. And um, I thought that was an important thing for us to share as we begin, because there are many kinds of pain. Uh, this webinar is certainly not comprehensive. We have chosen four areas of pain that are very common, um, and we have authors who have written about them who can share some wisdom about that. And so please know that we're not uh, trying to pretend that we're speaking of all kinds of pain. There are many others that are beyond the scope uh, of this webinar. Um, the other thing that I want to mention as well is that in our Christian tradition, uh, we believe that pain, suffering, uh, it can be and is redemptive. By the, that's a hard thing for us to grasp sometimes. And the only disclaimer I want to say about that is when we say that pain and suffering is redemptive, that doesn't mean that as Christians, we, we simply passively endure it. Okay? Um, God does not will that we suffer, and God wants our suffering and pain to be alleviated. In the midst of that, however, we can find redemptive grace. And so to have four panelists talking with us today about how we can help to alleviate suffering is what God wants. God does not want us to suffer. And so keep those intention, uh, uh, intention with each other, the fact that we are called to alleviate pain uh, and suffering, but also at the same time how in the midst of these examples, of these experiences, we can find grace and redemption. I just thought that was an important uh, disclaimer to, to add in some ways. But um, let's jump into our first topic. And, and we're going to talk to Maureen right now, who, who wrote Handbook for Those Who Grieve. And Maureen, uh, you have a, a very um, significant quote in your book. You say, death strikes. Your life is shattered. Tranquility and order are replaced by chaos and confusion. Yesterday's gone, it will not return. In its absence, you begin a new and mysterious journey, a journey through grief. Um, all of us, I know, can relate to the notion of grief. Um, I, I have This has personally affected me in the last three months. I, I have attended uh, between six and seven wakes and funerals of people who were close to me, and and so grief is a, a a reality for us. It's it's a part of my life as well. But you you wrote this book um, because of the ministry that you entered into. So Maureen, talk to us about what we need to understand uh, about the pain of grief. Oh, thank you very much for the question. Um, you know, Marty Oz and I are co-authors of the book. And when we started to do the book on grief, we did not want it to be a real heavy book about $25 words. Uh, and then you have to have a dictionary to find out, well, how am I supposed to feel? What is, what is the terminology now? Um, geez, nobody's getting to what I feel inside. Um, I want it broken down. Most people are really afraid of death. And attending, Joe, they're even afraid of attending a wake. They don't know what to say. And so it was our belief, you know, maybe we should gently turn the page and help people understand what this grief process is and how you can help somebody else and things to refrain from saying. Uh, and then understand that grief is many facets. It can be a final death. It can be someone that is terminally ill years in advance and that you have lost that person mentally in Alzheimer's, dementia, ALS. You're the caregiver. You have a different type of grief. It is not just the burial. It is before and how that person is suffering, the person that is dying, but the caregiver too. And everyone in that family nucleus, um, how can we help them? Yes, I know death is a matter of the heart. And when a heart is broken, it has to be mend. 
And how can we help one another? You can help by understanding the experience that they're going through and um, not trying to fix their pain and lessen their, oh, oh, don't get panicky and don't get fearful and don't dismiss their feelings. The biggest thing is you have to listen, understand and support them. And um, how you do that, you listen. And then you mirror what they're saying because they want to know, does anybody get me? Does anyone really understand what I'm feeling? And so um, when you do that, you understand that everyone has a different loss. You could have lost a pet that was your pet for 15 years. Mm -hmm. That's a reality. It's just not a death of a human person. What if, you know, you have to move? I'm a, a family person. That my mom and dad were very successful business people. I went to five different grammar schools in eight years. Wow. As a child, first grade, second, fifth, whatever, I had to say goodbye. I had to grieve all of my friends from mm -hmm. one state to another. Mm -hmm. So grief comes in little bitty packages. It comes in hard mm -hmm. of, you know, burying somebody. Uh, you have Alzheimer's. You have people that are having... Um, a birth, a stillbirth, they are robbed of yeah. that person's life. What about my dreams? What about that person that we had all of these hopes and admiration for? Eventually, we were going to create a family. So grief is just not, you know, a, a truly burying somebody. A man or a woman can lose a job. You can lose your status in the family. Um, there are broken relationships that you have to grieve on. So every day, then you kind of find out there are some different things going on in the world, but they're all grief. They're all revolving around loss. And you really do have to, um, sometimes you can work through it, but you definitely do need um, some help every once in a while. So, yeah, um, Maureen, that, that's all helpful for us. You've expanded our, our understanding of grief um, beyond simply the, the burying of a loved one. Um, I have one question myself that I'd like to ask, and then we're going to ask you to, to talk a little bit more about some of the, the insights you have about how we help, how we accompany. Uh, sometimes people are afraid to stop grieving because they feel that that means they've forgotten the person, that, sure. that, that perhaps they're letting go of that person. Can you speak to that? Well, definitely, um, that is a reality. I'm going to tell you that even though you grief takes a long time, it is work. It is um, uh, a really a duration. I have a lady friend. Um, she was just in tears yesterday. She said, my mother has been gone four years. Mm. It's real for me still. Those are the anniversary dates, the birth dates, you yeah. know, those kind of keep going. So you're never, ever going to forget the person because you, that person was a very predominant person in your life. They made an impact in your life. You're never going to ever forget them. They, they're a part of you and uh, time will heal, but you will never forget them. You know? that's, that's very helpful, Maureen. Um, thank you for sharing that. And you offer a lot of advice in, in your book. And, and I, I wish I could have each of you just for an hour to talk about things, but to give us a taste. Uh, in your book, you say by listening, caring, using common sense, giving encouragement and reassurance, sharing honest feelings, you can help the bereaved accept the death of their beloved. Perhaps just take a few minutes now and, and expound on What's some other insights and advice that you can give us? Because most of us are not comfortable uh, going to Wake's funerals. We don't know what to say. We're afraid we're going to say something dumb or hurtful even or damaging. And so sometimes we don't go and, and sometimes we don't say anything. So give us some of your insights uh, in, from your experience in this ministry. Oh, you know, Joe, there are a lot of... Um good things to say and then there are hurtful things to say and it's not intentional uh one example um this someone that was uh widowed just was married a few years another one would say oh don't worry you'll marry again okay that 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 was just a slap in the face to the bereaved person 
you have to think about it. You have to just actually not say anything. And that, as a human being, is kind of hard not to say. We want to fix everybody. So we don't want you to be sad. Um, you cannot fix people's pain. They have to go through it. You accompany them on their journey by listening, by definitely not trying to fix it, not hurry them through there. You listen to them and you mirror what they are telling you. They want to know, is anybody listening? Does anybody really care? This is how I feel today. And tomorrow they're going to come out with another statement because that's how they feel. It is a moment by moment journey in your grief. Um, it's just not one, two, three. Okay, I read this book. I fill out this book. I'm done. Oh, no. Grief is a lifetime. And however, you don't want to rush through it. You take your time. And there are support groups that you can go to. There are um, one great avenue is journaling. Mm -hmm. Put down your thoughts. You don't have to share this with anyone. Get it on a computer and start typing your heart away. Because there's going to be countless nights that you are not being able to sleep and your mind is going over and over again. Um, what I should have done, what I didn't do. Yeah. Um, and so that's how you can journal. You can talk in support groups. You can uh, contact your parish priest or your uh, per, uh, medical provider if you think that you're a little stuck. But um, supporting them and uh, encouraging them that there is no right or wrong grief at this point. It is your feelings and speak them. And by speaking them or writing them down, you lessen your heart a little. Maureen, that's that's so helpful. Great advice for, for all of us. And there's so much more in your book. I encourage people to take a look at Handbook for Those Who Grieve, uh, because all of us are going to experience moments where we need to accompany someone. Um, and we need to cope ourselves uh, with with the pain of uh, losing someone. I have a friend of mine who followed uh, uh, your advice in, in many ways that after he listens to the, the person share their pain, his response is, is almost always, I know, I know, mm -hmm. I, I'm here. Yes. That's all he yeah. says. He acknowledges mm -hmm. that he heard that their pain is real and that he's present instead of trying to explain or respond and, and so on. And so, Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of uh, strategies that you offer us in your book. Sure. That is, that's true. I mean, the book is pretty much just a step-by-step -step of different scenarios, and it might not pertain to you and your particular loss, but then you see another person's pain, and you go, I think she feels like I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then you can learn like, well, okay, maybe my pain is real intense right now, but I can learn from her. And boy, am I sympathetic to her now because I yes. see it in her life and this is okay, you know, and we're going to grow together with that. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Maureen. I want to see if any of the other panelists want to jump in. We have time for one of you if you want to jump in and, and share anything on this topic. <laughs> You know, I would say, um, Maureen, your your advice about not trying to fix things. Um, I had two miscarriages between my first two children, and I can't tell you, we were church ministers at the time, and one of the miscarriages was at 17 weeks, and how people wanted to tell me things to make me feel better, like, oh, the baby was probably deformed anyway, or mm -hmm. you'll get pregnant again, or, you know, um, all, all you want is someone to say, I'm so sorry. That's it. Just That's see the person, you know, true. so your advice is so spot on as somebody who's, and I was young at the time, I didn't know, you know, what to do. So thank you so much for your ministry. No problem. It's, it's, a, it's a joy to be with him. Um, my husband, when I first got into the ministry, he said, well, you're not going to be coming home every night and talking about these dead people's problems, <laughs> you know, and I said, honey, I won't bring those home. But then when I went to these support groups and wrote bulletins, the, the monthly birth, uh, you know, bulletin announcements, and it taught the people how to grieve and how to accept, um, it turned out that every day I did something like that, I got more than what they were giving. You know, I thought I was giving to them and they were appreciative. But I come back and I say, they let me in on some real tough personal sure. stories. They trusted me with their pain, and and I just listened. 
And and that's what it's all about. Also, uh, and I couldn't have children for five years. I grieve. The whole world was having kids. Why me, God? You know, and so there, you know, you have to go through all of those things. You know, eventually we did have a family, you know. But um, thank you very much for your comment. And it's yeah. it's others. And, and thank you, Maureen, for for sharing uh, such wonderful advice for us, uh, both of you, Anne and Maureen, for um, courageously sharing some of your personal stories as well. That's that's very much appreciated. Appreciated. Um, we'd like to move on and talk about another um, type of pain that's all too common uh, in many of our lives. The, the ex- pain that's experience of walking with someone or experiencing ourself uh, addiction. And uh, Jean, uh, you wrote the book, Helping Families Recover from Addiction. And in that book, you talk about with addiction, there are so many variables at play. We, We grasp at straws, trying different things to fix our loved ones and and I, I get the sense that the, if I recall the rest of that page there's there's a big butt coming there after <laughs> saying we try to fix ourselves however but uh, you you offer a lot of personal experience uh, in this book talk to us uh, about the, the pain of addiction and what we need to know as we approach this reality Okay. Well, ironically, um, both for the addict or alcoholic and the family member, we we try to avoid pain. Um, the, 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 the person that's suffering with an addiction uses a substance or an action to avoid their pain, and the family member tries to fix and control to avoid their pain. So pain is the cost of admission for recovery. We have to learn to go through it and we have to be um, willing to face the pain. We have a lot of acronyms in um, 12 step rooms and one of them is fear. And um, some people will say it's false evidence appearing real. Um, But, Mm -hmm. you know, later on we'll say it stands for face everything and recover. Um, So, so pain is a big part of you know, walking with someone that suffers from an addiction, uh, you're watching your loved one do harmful things to themselves and possibly others. And uh, it takes a lot of courage to be able to let go of that and work your own program. But that's when things get better. And it's so interesting that you started by saying that so much of addiction is caused by the trying to avoid pain trying to deny pain um and often the the pain is is so uh palpable in the people surrounding the person with addiction and and that's what your book is is about is helping families recover from addiction and the pain that comes with watching uh someone that you love go through that uh, you share and they're very hopeful uh comment you say the good news is that there are things we can do that aid our own recovery uh, and then in turn our loved ones will be affected by our positive changes that this is different than saying we can fix things Mm -hmm. so talk to us a little bit more gene about some advice that you would offer to any of us who are accompanying someone walking through the pain of addiction sure um you know, they say that addiction is a family disease, and it is. Um, there, There is a lot. Of, I, I often say we're two different sides of the same coin. Mm. Um, you can't fix or, or control another person. You don't have any power over another person. So what's left is you. What can you change in you? What needs healing in you? Uh, I tell parents all the time, my children don't ever listen to what I have to say. But they're always watching what I'm doing. And so when I work on me, when I start to take care of myself physically, spiritually, and emotionally, um, they notice that. I- I'll tell people that we don't have the ch- power to change another person, but the changes that we make within ourselves, those changes have the power to affect another person. 
And Jean, maybe I can ask you to clarify this a little bit more too, because I'm sure some people are are in this situation think, well, I need to to change myself because I'm probably the cause of this problem. Right. Uh, well, we we have another little saying. We have the three C's: you didn't cause it, you can't cure it, and you can't control it. The fourth C is you can contribute. So what we learn to do in 12 step programs is not to contribute to their disease. Um, if you look at the 12 steps and at the spiritual exercises um, closely, you'll realize that what they do, what they each do are heal our rela relationships to God, self and others. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember thinking, you know, that's so strange. How is it that that helps an addiction? But, um, I don't know a person on the planet that can't benefit from working on their relationships to God, self, and others. Um, it just makes a difference. It is like the house that Jack built. You really have to work on that first foundational uh, relationship. If, if you're not Christian, your higher power, whoever that is, whatever that is, you have to work on that relationship first before you will be able to deal with the relationship that you have with yourself. And that's really important. If I don't have something in my own arsenal to draw from, I can't help another person. Yeah. So it's it's just really important that those relationships be dealt with. Thank you, Jean. And uh, again, especially for the, the courage it takes for you to, to share your own story. But um, so appreciative that you've been sharing with other people through your book, through your ministry, um, how we can um, aid our own recovery, how we can grow, how we can not contribute to, um, you know, bad things to the person's addiction, but help in their recovery. Uh, your book is, is such a, a gift to us. And thank you for, again for sharing your experience with us. Does anyone else from the panel want to, to jump in and share a a thought or insight about this particular pain that we're discussing? I've got a question, Jean, for you. Um, how do you handle, you know, a death from um, the addiction? Does that come up in your loss? Yeah, I mean, addiction is a, a big cause of either overdose or suicide is usually tied to addiction. Mm -hmm. It is uh, um, the elephant in the room. You know, we don't like to talk about death when we enter a 12-step room, but it, it it is something that we have to pay attention to. It is a possibility. They say that um, addicts or alcoholics have three paths. They can find recovery. They can be uh, institutionalized either with jail or a mental health facility, or they can die. Those are the only three paths. There are no other options. So yes, we we look at we we have to look at that possibility and understand the grave consequences of not seeking recovery. And yeah. and I think that's why you know you were saying you were glad that I was sharing this, but it's really so important that we understand that anonymous and secret are not the same thing. Mm. Um, I don't share my loved one's information and I got his permission before I even started writing, but I talk about addiction a lot. And if more people talked about it, it would be, you know, take some of the mystery away from it. I think that's just so important is that we stop conflating those two words. That's, that's very important. And, and I, I think, you know, Another thing that I appreciate, not just by Eugene, but all of uh, all of our panelists, um, is that, and I'm sure our our participants can see from this conversation, we're not talking pie in the sky. You know, how do we get people to smile? I mean, th this is plain talk, and I appreciate that all of you do this. You you cut through, and just speak. You know, directly. And that's that's what's I think so important to to get beyond the the denial that is a part of so much of our pain, especially in in the world of addiction. 
Uh, thank you, Jean, for uh, for sharing those brief insights with us. Uh, again, hopefully we can, can come back to you in the Q&A, uh, but especially I encourage people to uh, get a copy of your book to delve deeper. Um, let's move on now and talk about uh, another uh, kind of pain that uh, is affecting uh, many of us who are uh, aging baby boomers. Um, we're all getting older. And uh, but it's also affecting the uh, Gen Xers who are taking care of us or are, are going to take care of us as we age. Uh, Barbara, you, you wrote Praying Through Pain, as you said before, not necessarily about aging. You wrote to the general topic of aging. But we asked you to, to focus in this particular webinar about the, the pain that, that comes with, with aging. And uh, you share in your book, you say when when we're sick or grieving, the ways that we usually pray might not feel right. When we try to pray in our own words, the words won't come. When we try to recite prayers that we know by heart, the words don't give comfort. Praying through pain very often calls for a new approach. So obviously here we're, you're giving away the secret that prayer is a big part of your um, advice for accompanying people with pain. So talk to us uh, about your understanding of the, the pain of aging and also the role that prayer plays. Well, older adults suffer from all the same kinds of pain as people of any other age because it strikes at all ages. But older adults also experience some kinds of suffering that are particular to the aging. And I'm going to focus on three. Okay. Diminishment, dependence, and caregiving. Diminishment. We have mobility limitations. We have vision and hearing limitations. We have to give up driving. That is a big one. And that's where younger family members often move in and take control. And so we have dependence. When a person who has been self-sufficient for a lifetime suddenly needs a ride to the doctor or to the hairdresser, and may soon need a caregiver. Caregiving often involves role reversal, and that can be very painful for both the caregiver and the recipient of the care. There are a lot of women in their 60s, and it's almost always women, who are caregivers for parents in their 80s and 90s. Yeah. And for the recipient of the care, it's such an indignity to be told what to do by an adult child or worse, by an aide, a stranger. Mm -hmm. So, these are some of the situations, particular to the aging, where it's really hard to pray. And sometimes the only words that come out are, why me? Yeah. Or help in capital letters. <laughs> well, one thing that can help is being, praying with those who have been there. And I don't mean someone who has had the same knee replacement or the same kind of tumor. I mean the people who have had the same kind of emotions, anger, impatience, fear, helplessness, and a great place to find these people is in the Bible, which has a great many stories of people who experienced all these emotions. And praying with pain introduces you 
to some of these people. For example, the chapter on impatience suggests praying with Psalm 13, which begins, how long, O oh Lord, how long, how long? Yeah. I think a lot of people can relate to that. And the chapter on grief invites the reader to be with the mother and friends of Jesus during that interminable Sabbath after the crucifixion and share their deep sorrow. They didn't know how the story ended. Um, Barbara, thank you so much for um, helping us to understand more about uh, the pain of aging and especially those three uh, areas, diminishment, dependence, and, and caregiving. Uh, as soon as you said that, I, I just I thought back to when my mom was in the nursing home before she passed, which is uh, going on uh, five, six years now. And I remember particularly one time when I, I visited her and she was being brought out of uh, her bathroom by the caregiver. And my mom was very much embarrassed. And and she said, um, she just shook her head and she said, I used to wipe your bottoms. Mm -hmm. And now, and, you know, she didn't have to finish. Yeah. And... Um, so, you know, I, I find myself in one of those situations now where now I'm accompanying someone in the, the pain of of aging, my own mother. Um, you have some insights to share with us about how we can do that. Please yes, share yes. with us. Um, in accompanying people in pain, I have two key words, listening and compassion. And I'm so glad that Maureen talked about listening because yes. that just helps us all to understand that this is something that applies to all kinds of pain. People need to be listened to. Now, listening, truly listening, isn't always easy. We want to interrupt. We want to ask questions. We want to contradict. We want to minimize problems. Don't. Don't do it. Listen with your heart. Don't be afraid of silences. Don't take refuge in small talk. And please put away your phone where nobody can see it. <laughs> Let the person know that you are fully present to them. And believe me, they will know you can't fake it. So that leads to compassion because obviously they're related. If you listen with your heart, you're already showing compassion. Now, what is compassion? It's not pity, oh, you poor thing. And it's not really empathy where you're trying to understand the person's situation, although that's a very good start. But in compassion, you're really trying to feel what the other person is feeling. You're trying to put yourself in that person's shoes so that you can truly understand the experience and that isn't always easy either and i think compassion is a grace and i tell people to pray for the grace to be compassionate yeah. and having said that i want to give some practical suggestions <laughs> about how to be compassionate um, the first is to avoid latitudes. And again, I'm kind of um, overlapping a little bit with uh, Maureen, but because um, I think in grief situations, people fall back on platitudes, but they do it also with people who are sick. Yeah. I know how you feel. Nobody knows how another person feels. And in particular, young people do not know what it feels like to grow old, believe me. And another one that can really be toxic 
is, oh, you look wonderful. And that is intended as a compliment, but it can be heard as a denial of the person's pain. Mm -hmm. So avoid that. Um, excuse me, I had a third one here. Oh, this is embarrassing. I had a third oh, one, okay. and I can't find it. But, um, oh, the, the final thing is to not to be more controlling than is necessary. Now, if a person has had a massive stroke or is in the later stages of dementia, they're not able to participate in the decision-making. But most situations are not that extreme. So I, I say this particularly to the adult children of sick people, respect their personality, respect their individuality, consult their desires whenever possible. Don't just give the indignity of making all the decisions for them. And finally, be realistic. I really like um, the advice of Catherine Cavaney, who is a professor of law and theology at Boston College. Mm -hmm. And she says, in building the kingdom of God, sometimes the best thing you can do is wipe away a tear. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. And, and Barbara, I'm so glad that you talked about compassion. It was actually the word that I was looking for in the opening slide when I was introducing uh, the four of you panelists, uh, that you are four women of great compassion. That's a powerful word. And thank you for uh, the advice that you shared, um, the insights, because all of us are either dealing with us uh, with this now or will be dealing with it at some point in our lives. Does uh, another panelist have anything you want to add uh, briefly to this uh, conversation? I'll say, um, that, you know, kind of the common theme that, you know, I hear in all of these things um, is when we accompany, um, you know, there are things not to do and things to do. But I think understanding that accompaniment a lot might offer courage to the person that's suffering. If they don't have the courage and you're standing by them, it might help them to be brave enough to do what they need to do. At least that's the case in, in um, recovery circles. Uh, that's what, that's what they say, you know, take it to your sponsor because your sponsor's been there before and, and they'll loan you their courage until you, you have your own. That, that's great advice, Jean. I remember when uh, my mother-in-law passed away and my wife um, was asked to say a few words, uh, eulogy after communion uh, at the mass, the funeral mass. And she asked if I would come and stand next to her. And not to say anything, not to do anything. She just wanted that uh, some strength next to her, someone that she could find strength from. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's wonderful advice. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean, and also Barbara, especially. And I'd like to turn now to our, our last category for this conversation. Uh, we're going to talk to Anne uh, kurtz Kernian now, who wrote the book Spiritual Practices for the Brain. And uh, Anne, while your book is not specifically about pain, as I mentioned before, you, you offer so many great um, insights that are directly related to to pain that uh, and we're going to talk about pain that's associated with stress and anxiety in particular and and this is, of course is something that is um becoming more and more real for many people and especially many young people today and we can be tempted again as barbara was saying we can be attempt tempted sometimes to trivialize this and just tell people to chill you know okay you're stressed out just chill um, but there's a lot more to it. So please talk to us first of all, uh, first of all about your understanding of um, the pain of stress and anxiety. Thanks, Joe. You know what's remarkable is I wanted to start my little section here by talking about the fact that when we accompany and support 
another person who's in pain, we actually wind up lessening their perceived pain level. There's neuroscience that shows that just having a loved one in a room where you might be getting a shot or something physical, mm -hmm. and like your wife, Joe, asked for you to stand next to her, mm -hmm. her body was actually calmed by your presence there. Mm. And if someone, if a loved one is in pain, just there's a lot of great neuroscience research that shows our wow. presence actually lessens the perceived pain of that person. And if we're holding someone's hand, we know that that lessens their pain. So the one thing that I love sharing is how much our thoughts matter too. Often our stress and anxiety is simply occurring between our ears here, that we can be, say, in a traffic jam, or we can have um, something occurring to us and we are all stressed out. But say we're in a traffic jam and we're going to be late for an important meeting, we're stressed because we want something to happen. But our stress levels increasing and increasing and increasing and our anxiety that ramps up is not going to make that traffic jam any lighter or is the cars aren't going to move any faster. I always mention that, you know, there's traffic on the other side of the road that might be also in a traffic jam. You're not caring about that. You care about what's happening to you and because it's important to you. So often just reminding ourselves we are stressed and anxious because we care deeply about what it is we are stressed and anxious about. And just reminding ourselves, like William James said over 100 years ago, the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. So teaching ourselves to be much more aware of our thoughts winds up tuning our stress and turning that stress down. Um, just And the other piece too is that it's important to know that often our thoughts can't control our stress. We need to use our bodies somehow. Mm -hmm. So in my book on the breath and on the silent prayer, I talk about how important it is to use either breath practices. In my chapter on nature, I talk about how helpful it is just to go outside and be, you know, move around trees or just seeing the clouds in the sky, using our bodies to move a little bit or to just simply focus on our breath. You know, our the word breath is in many languages, like in Latin, it's the word spirare, which also means spirit. So mm. in Greek, the word pneuma means both breath and spirit. So there's this connection between yeah. our breath and our spiritual life. So when we are breathing, we are also connected to the spirit. And so just reminding ourselves that God is present with us through our breath. And we know that if we take moments throughout the day, simply to pause and take a breath that tamps down our nervous system, allows our bodies to heal if it's something that we need to get over an illness, et cetera. It tamps down inflammation, it raises our immunity. We wanna practice this though, a little breath practice, maybe more frequently instead of long periods, because we know that Frequency is more important than duration. We're changing our brains and we want to make sure that we do this frequently. One of my favorite teachers is Brother Lawrence, a, a monk who lived in the 1600s. And he talks about staying in the presence of God, that the practice of the presence of God is the most primary practice of all, reminding ourselves that God is with us. And if we keep reminding ourselves of that, that will help us tamp down our anxiety and our stress. But being mindful of what those thoughts are and then learning to let them go through prayer, through the breath, just diverting our attention to God instead of ruminating over what it is we might be thinking about. When we're in pain, the pain may take us and the latest neuro that much pain is simply brain connections that are telling us, giving us information, which may or may not be physically derived. Um, but it's not that the pain is fake. It's just that our brain is trying to protect us. So if we can learn to tr train our brains to take some moments, take a deep breath, 
let go and let God, that will often be a great way to alleviate some stress and some anxiety. And go ahead and lead us through a brief example of that. I'm a firm well, believer in this notion of taking a deep breath. Show yeah. us a practical way that we do that. Sure. There's two of them, and we'll just do each one very briefly. One of the pieces that neuroscience tells us is that the four, six breath or the four, eight breath, breathing in through our nose for the, at the count of four, and then lengthening our exhalations, either to the count of six or eight or even longer. We know that extended exhalations tamp down our nervous system and bring us a great peace. So what I do is t teach people to say, let's sit in God's, say to yourself, I breathe in God's love. I rest in God's peace. I breathe in God's love. I rest in God's peace and extend that I rest in God's peace so that it takes longer. And so maybe for just a few seconds, we can all cross our arms over our hearts, close our eyes, and just for a few breaths, repeat to yourselves as you breathe in, I breathe in God's love. I rest in God's peace. I breathe in God's love. I rest in God's peace. And then you can bring your hands away from your heart. Even just placing our hands on our chest and on our heart gives our, our bodies a little bit of oxytocin, which is the feel-good hormone, and it actually helps us to tamp our nervous systems down. So if we're accompanying people in pain, just doing this little practice with them can help their bodies relax a little bit and bring a little bit of calm to their perhaps frenzied stress and their frenzied nervousness that they might be experiencing from anxiety. So those are that's just one little practice. I have many others in my in my book on that chapter, but um, really good ways that we can teach ourselves to calm our bodies, calm our minds, and remind ourselves we are in God's presence at all times. Your book is chock full of of ideas like that, and and it's so helpful. And and what I love about it is that it's grounded in science, it's grounded in research, and it's so important, especially to our young people today who uh, sometimes are tempted to dismiss uh, religion uh, mm -hmm. in favor of science. And what you're doing is bringing them together and saying that our, many of our spiritual practices are grounded in science, that they actually have an effect on us. And thank you, Anne, for, for sharing those. Uh, and again, there are just so many in the book, and I, I love to sit through, uh, I've sat through your presentation several times, and I'm just always, I go home like, I got to try this, I got to try <laughs> these. So the, great um, suggestions, practical suggestions. Uh, but it's time now for us to go to Q&A and to see if our um, participants have some questions. I'm going to invite my colleague, Denise, to come back up now and to share with us uh, any questions that we have for either a specific panelist or for uh, the panel in general. Denise? Okay. Uh, I think this may start with Maureen on this one. Um, Bob mentions that people in the chat have been commenting that we should use the words death, die, loss, when our culture tends to um, uh, euphemize those words with things like past. Do the words we use matter? The words do matter because, um, first of all, if you're talking to a bereaved person that's grieving, you have to find out, get a sense of where they're from. What are they a little bit comfortable with? Okay. Uh, if they don't like to hear that word, that's just like chalk on a chalkboard or, you know, your nails on it, then you have to be, again, listening, looking for their body language, things like that. Um, so death um, as long as you understand where the people are coming from and how to help them, um, you want to you want to speak their language. Look for their body language again, and um, you know, passing on that kind of like smooths it over. Okay, you can use that one or time. They're gone. You know, they're no longer here. Those are tender little words, but yeah, take 
the cue from the bereaved person. And also you have to know, are you speaking to a child? You know, uh, they think, well, dad's just gone. He's going to be back. You know, uh, there's all sorts of ways that uh, people get things a little bit mixed up. Very helpful. Next, Denise. Yes. Um, Paula asks, with all the pain the panelists witnessed, what do you do for self-care? Anyone? It's very hard to follow our own advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I have to share that um, my brother committed suicide 30 years ago. So what do you do? Yeah, you fall apart. We all fall apart. And what do we need? We need each other. Um, so yeah, yeah, you have to go back to the book and, and kind of say, okay, I got to be good to myself. You know, um, it's a hard road, but it will get better. And treat yourself as you would a good friend. I have a whole chapter in my book on self-compassion. And think about how a good friend would talk to you. Talk to yourself like a good friend would talk to you. What and just the question. basics. Go ahead, Jean. Uh, just the basics that we have an acronym HALT. Am I hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? <laughs> Notice what you're, you're feeling and take care of any of those needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What a great question. Um, you have another one, Denise? Yes. Um, Tick asks, the hardest thing for me is to leave a person alone in pain, like an el elderly relative who cries when I have to leave. Any thoughts on how to depart well when emotions are so high? Well, what they're feeling is panic. They're, they've got fear. They have a sense of being alone and and they're not comfortable in that new life and so um i think you have to reiterate that things will get better okay yes death is here uh whether they're um healing you know a health issue or a, a pass of someone like their spouse that's died or something like that it's that feeling of helplessness and just reassure them that you are not alone. I see you. I hear you. I will be back. Here's my phone number. You have to reassure them. And in time, um, it will get less. But you have to repeat. You have to repeat. So uh, not repeat for a week. If it takes a year, we repeat. You, you travel that journey of uh, compassion with them. I sat yesterday with a, a friend who was going through a very difficult situation. And when I was leaving, uh, she, she said, Joe, I'm so scared. And so it was, you know, when leaving that she was, you know, fearing being alone. And I, I tried to say many of the things, Maureen, that you just suggested, including uh, saying in that, that God is, is with you. And she said, Joe, I struggle with that. And I said, I understand that. I says, from from where you're at, that get, that can be a difficult thing to accept. From what you're going through, it's difficult to think that God is there. And I said, from my perch, uh, I can recognize that God is with you. And sometimes that's what a person needs to hear. Uh, they may not feel it, but they need to be assured by someone else and told that it's okay if they don't recognize it, they don't see it, they don't feel it. Sometimes they need another person to say God is here, even especially because they're not feeling it. Anyone else? Let's do one more, Denise, if you have one. Okay. Um, I'm not sure who submitted this question. It's from Anonymous. Asks, do you recommend retreats or resources that take an Ignatian approach to help those uh, in pain? Short answer, yes. Anyone want to expound on that? There are Ignatian recovery retreats mm -hmm. all over the country. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know as a society if people are really uh, 
they want to put themselves out there. They're vulnerable. And sometimes they, they want to do it by themselves. Um, a retreat might be a big leap of faith. Um, whereas a small little a conversation with a therapist, a parish priest, a, a, a bereavement minister in the parish, that might be their starting point of their comfort level when they grow. And then they might want to go into a retreat type thing. But I know I would personally, I'd shy away from that. I don't know, you know, 20 years ago, um, no one went to a therapist. It was, you know, like, oh my gosh, you know, you have to go to a therapist. You must be crazy lady. Mm -hmm. Now we understand that self-help is what we all need. We have to recognize that when we have to reach out to each other. So um, I, I think just a lower level, uh, do a lot of journaling, speak to people. And again, just keep telling your story. In your story, you will get your strength. You will gather your faith back because you are not alone. Like Joe said, you know, they have to hear somebody hears me. Somebody sees me. OK, I'm scared to be alone, but it will get better. And it's going to take a long time. So let me if you don't mind, as somebody who leads retreats quite often, <laughs> a couple once or twice a month, I would say the one thing that people often are a little bit nervous, like you said, Maureen, about going, but they bring a friend. And everyone, almost to a woman, mostly it's women who are on my retreats, um, leave with such comfort from sharing what they feel with others. You know, our connect when we connect with others, we just find, all of us know, we find so much comfort most of the time. And, you know, the, re the retreat settings, if it's done well, you know, really nurtures this community. And people go back with this great big well of of support and feelings of being listened to. So, um, but if people are really a little bit worried about going, bringing a friend is often the first way to do that if you do want to go on a retreat. True. Um, in our parish, we brought in a group called Joyful Again, and that came into the parish for widows and widowers. And um, they didn't want to go to a retreat. I want to sleep in my own bed, but they come in the morning. It's a two-day retreat. You have your sharing, you have your meals, mm -hmm. and then you look at somebody and go, I think I'm a little bit better along in my grief than this person, <laughs> but I was there, you know? And so, yes, you can feel um, the support of somebody else, and there is value in that, you know? And, it, and it, you have to be almost ready for that program, but a retreat is a good idea. Well, excellent. I'm conscious of the time. I wish we could uh, take more questions and listen to the four of you. Uh, Denise, thank you for leading our Q&A. Um, but we are out of time right now. And so uh, I, I want to thank our four panelists uh, for the, the wonderful uh, job you did in this webinar, uh, your wonderful books, which are on the screen. I'm going to tell people in a moment how they can, can get these but also for your great compassion. And I'm glad that um, Barbara uh, brought that word to the forefront uh, because compassion is at the heart of accompanying people who are experiencing pain. And you did such a wonderful job of sharing that. And, and your books are, are just uh, packed with much more compassionate insight and, and advice. So I just wanna thank all four of you for uh, being with us during this time and uh, hope to, to uh, see and speak with you again sometime soon. So let me tell people about uh, your books. They're on the screen. And so we, uh, we start with the handbook for those who grieve uh, by Maureen. And you can see each of the books has a QR code, which you can go to. Or if you look on the left, you can go to store.loyolapress.com or go to our customer service, 800-621-1008. Uh, from Barbara, we have Praying Through Pain. From Jean, we have Helping Families Recover from Addiction. And from Anne, Spiritual Practices for the Brain. These are four books that are written by compassionate women who are sharing real life strategies, insights, and wisdom to help us accompany others in pain. 
And I think it's important for all of us to know going forward that everyone is carrying some kind of pain. And we just talked about four kinds today. And so I can't thank our panelists enough. I can't thank uh, all of you participants enough uh, for spending the time with us and now going forward and bringing that compassion uh, that comes to us from the, the love of God uh, through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to bring to the world that is in such need uh, of this compassion and of the alleviating of pain and suffering. Uh, the recording will be available very soon at LoyolaPress.com, as well as by email to all of you who have registered. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, participants. And may God give us all the strength to truly accompany those who are walking in pain. Until next time, I'm Joe Paprocki. God bless. Amen. Thank you. God bless everyone.